All right, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to finish out um, our talk about Mendelian genetics. Uh, we'll, of course, go into much more detail about some of these aspects uh, next fall when we actually do genetics. So, concept 14.4 uh, many human traits follow Mendelian patterns of inheritance. Now, there's a big problem with that. So humans are not good subjects for research. Our generation time is too long. We produce very few offspring. And for some reason, people frown on the idea of doing selective breeding. So as you can imagine, we need to come up with an alternative for studying people. And most of this is done through something that we call pedigree analysis. So a pedigree is a family tree that describes the interrelationships uh, inter of parents and the children across generations and help track uh, various conditions. So let's take a look at some of the symbols that we use. So um, we use a square for males and a circle for females. If we fill in that square, that is referring to an affected male or a male that is um, displaying symptoms of some type of genetic disorder. Same true for females, we fill in for that. When we refer to mating, uh, we will take a male and a female and draw a line between them. And then when we uh, produce offspring, they um, are all listed in a single series with the firstborn being on the left hand side followed by second born third born fourth born so forth so if we start taking a look at uh, particular inheritable traits so here we have uh, something called a widow's peak uh, it says when you have a slight uh, v-shape extension of hair coming into the forehead. Not everybody has this, but if you start taking a chart of people being married, having kids, and pay attention to where we see um, that trait show up, you can see here that um, this is an individual displaying that trait, came from parents displaying that trait, um, coming from their parents, you see a parent there, parent there. So if you look at the genetics here, knowing that we have a characteristic here, and um, we can see that these individuals clearly are heterozygote in nature, since we have an unaffected and infected, um, or I guess this is a, a trait, so we're not really affected, but you get the idea. So you can see that this individual must be heterozygote, this individual must be heterozygote since they are displaying the trait. Clearly, this must be a dominant trait, right? And you can follow this back and make certain predictions that way. You could do, um, and you know, in, in seeing those traits, we can start going backwards and start identifying particular aspects. So, like this mother we knew was little w, little w. We didn't know what this person was, but by the fact that they had offspring, which were um, did not display the trait, clearly this individual had to be heterozygote in nature. Uh, same thing is true over here. We have a mixture of children. All right, let's take a look at another uh, inheritable trait. So we either have attached earlobes or free earlobes. And you can start off here seeing um, here is a female um, affected or displaying the attached earlobe trait. Uh, here we have a female that doesn't. We are unsure of their genotype. 
we can then start tracing this backwards. Clearly, this individual has to be a heterozygote, and so does this person. Um, so you can infer um, certain aspects of this, right? So you can kind of follow the trace, uh, follow the trait back. And in this case, we can see that it is following a recessive uh, type characteristic. All right. Um, now, when we're looking at recessive alleles, it's going to give us this inheritance patterns that only shows up occasionally, right? So when you have a re recessive disorder, you would only see it when uh, you have a homozygote uh, situation. What this means is that there are carriers in the population who are heterozygote for the condition, but phenotypically normal. So here's an, uh, another example of this, uh, albinoism. And um, it would follow a typical recessive pattern. This is something that if you built a um, pedigree chart for, you could start tracing this back through generations. And people probably would have paid attention to, oh, yeah, gr grandma was an albino too, right? Now, if a recessive allele is rare, um, and this particular recessive allele causes some type of uh, disease, the, the chance of two carriers meeting and mating is fairly low. Now, if you start inbreeding, such as marrying your cousins, um, you start to see the, you increase the chance of that type of mating happening. So this is ultimately where this idea of you don't want to marry your, your sister comes up with, or you don't want to marry your brother, you don't want to marry siblings. It's from an observation from societies that when this happens, some bad genetic outcomes can occur. Or in this case, uh, historically, you might see, oh, yeah, they had a cursed child, right? You see it uh, in all kinds of writings. So this is how it comes um where these laws come from and you know pretty much all societies and cultures have these type of taboos and when you look at deviations from that such as in royal families where you don't have a lot of people that fall into the category of being worthy of marrying a royalty you do get inbreeding and you start seeing uh, various conditions crop up. Um, so anemia was, was fairly common um, and uh, hemorrhaging disorders, you would see, you see recordings of that in history. All right, let's take a look at another genetic disorder. So cystic fibrosis is a, a lethal disorder and in your, uh, people of European descent, it's uh, affecting about one out of every 25,000 or 2,500 people. So this particular disorder is all about a chloride uh, transport channel. So it's a protein in the plasma membrane that transports chloride. The cystic fibrosis is a dysfunctional version of this. And this will lead to a buildup of chloride ions um, outside the cell. Now, it just so happens that moving ions is one way that we can essentially cause water to flow within our bodies. Um, so in not being able to properly transport ions, we are not able to move liquid across a membrane space as well either or move that water. A side effect of this would be uh, mucus buildup in any place that we have um, mucous membranes. 
So this can lead to a number of different uh, conditions in people. So in the lungs, it can cause a buildup of mucus because it isn't as fluid because there is less water there. So this mucus buildup can cause breathing problems and can cause chronic infections. In the gut, uh, it can actually slow the absorption of nutrients, right? So it makes it harder for people with cystic fibrosis to gain the proper amount of, of nutrients. You can also take a look at another disorder, um, sickle cell anemia. So this affects uh, one out of uh, every 400 African Americans. This disease is caused by the substitution of a single amino acid in the hemoglobin protein. So this is the protein that carries oxygen. In homozygous individuals, hemoglobin is abnormal and it can uh, bind to itself causing long chains, which can cause fibers deforming the shape of the um, red blood cells. So this will lead to a breakage of those red blood cells, which will lead to anemia type of conditions, such as physical weakness, uh, pain, organ damage. And this is all from a single defect, which allows these hemoglobin molecules, which are supposed to be separate, to chain, uh, form these long chain or fibers, which deforms the cell. This will, of course, cause the cells to lice. Now, in heterozygote individuals, it does, in fact, cause some chains, cause some deformation, and has some sickle cell traits, but they aren't um, plagued by the larger symptoms of being homozygote uh, recessive in this order. So in this circumstance, you have red blood cells, which can still do their job, but they have a slightly shorter lifespan. This actually has an interesting side effect in that um, it will actually reduce your ability to suffer from malaria. Malaria has a cycle where it part of it replicates within our red blood cells. Since these red blood cells um, are lasting shorter, someone who is heterozygote for a sickle cell is actually protected from malaria. So consequently, we see an increase in sickle cell anemia in regions where we have high malaria because being protected from malaria is something that would be chosen for. Now, we can also have um, dominantly um, inherited uh, conditions. So here is um, a particular form of dwarfism, and that is inherited in a dominant manner. Um, so you do see um, that we have, we can have both recessive um, disorders and also um, dominant disorders as well. And I say disorder because um, these individuals do suffer from particular conditions and tend to have a shortened lifespan.